Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our Operative Dentistry series. This video will be all about tooth colored restorations, both composite resin and glass ionomer. We're going to cover a lot of high yield facts in this video and we'll start with composite. Now composite resin has the added benefit of retention via bonding. So let's kick off this video talking about what adhesive dentistry is all about. So adhesive dentistry was originally devised by Michael Buonacore in 1955. He was inspired by the industrial use of phosphoric acid to adhere paints and resins to metallic surfaces. So he asked, why not try this for teeth? So acid etching transforms a low energy smooth enamel surface into a high energy irregular surface thereby increasing its surface-free energy and wettability. What that basically means is a fluid-based resin will easily spread over the surface, whereas on this one, it would just beat up and fall right off. The resin is also able to flow into these irregularities, and when it polymerizes or solidifies, the material becomes mechanically interlocked within that enamel surface which explains why this bond is so strong. As long as the surface isn't contaminated with saliva beforehand, you can get over 20 megapascals of sheer bond strength, which is insanely strong for such a small surface area. However, bonding to dentin is much more difficult. If you do get a good bond, it can be just as strong as the enamel bond but the problem is, it's not nearly as reliable or predictable as it is when bonding to enamel. So why is that? Well, there are four main reasons I want to share with you that are frequently tested on the board exam. Number one is composition. So the enamel is about 90% mineral, which we know from our first video is hydroxyapatite, and dentin has much more organic matter, like type 1 collagen, and water and much less mineral in comparison. So dentin is not as impacted by the effects of the acid. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is structure. The enamel prisms are much more regular and etchable, while the dentinal tubules and collagen are like a maze. One of my mentors described it as a bowl of spaghetti, which I think is a really helpful analogy. The third reason is depth. So the fluid-filled dentinal tubules are much larger and more numerous as you get closer to the pulp. The dentinal fluid interferes with our bond integrity, so there's less bond strength the deeper you go into the tooth. The same can also be said for sclerotic dentin, which is often deeper into the tooth as well, and it's much more acid-resistant. And lastly, we have the smear layer. And I like to think of it as the sawdust from cutting with the burr. It's kind of like shavings of hydroxyapatite and collagen that plug the orifices of the dentinal tubules. And these smear plugs decrease dentin permeability by nearly 90%. So for all of these reasons, dentin is much harder to predictably bond to than enamel. Okay, so now that we know what's going on with both enamel and dentin, Let's talk through the actual clinical steps and materials. And the first step is the acid etch. So we want to place around 37% phosphoric acid gel etchant on the desired area and leave it on for 10 to 30 seconds. Routinely, 15 seconds is the magic number. Now etch does a couple things. One of the most important is it cleans surface debris and removes the smear layer on both enamel and dentin, so it dissolves away that pesky sawdust that's interfering with our bond. For enamel, we're looking for a chalky or frosty white appearance, and that's an optical effect. The enamel temporarily loses its translucency due to the formation of microporosities, and that's what we saw on that first slide changing from a smooth surface to a high energy irregular surface. And that's what's causing that frosty white appearance. And for the dentin, the etch exposes a layer of collagen 
and opens and widens those dentinal tubules. Then we rinse we rinse the etch off with water for about 10 seconds. And the important thing here is we can gently air dry that water to attain that frosty white appearance, but we wanna make it like freshly drying beach sand. So after this stage, we don't want the tooth to be soaking wet like the ocean, but we also don't want it to be bone dry like the hot sand over here. We want it somewhere in the middle, some kind of moist, middle ground between soaking wet and bone dry. Alternatively, you can use a desensitizer like Gluma to re-wet the tooth after you dry the water off. All right, so after etching, the second step is the primer. The primer is typically HEMA, which is hydroxyethyl methacrylate. That's what that stands for. And HEMA consists of an amphiphilic resin monomer wetting agent. Amphiphilic means it has a hydrophobic as well as a hydrophilic end. The hydrophilic end is what will contact the tooth surface. And then acetone, ethanol, or water act as the solvent that carries this valuable monomer. An excellent, excellent boards question is that HEMA, if it contacts skin, can cause an allergic reaction known as contact dermatitis, and that comes up all the time. The primer does not open dentinal tubules. That's what the etch did. It instead infiltrates the tooth surface and wets the surface of the dentin to prevent the collagen from collapsing and thus allows for better retention, or I should say better adhesion, which is where the next step of the process comes in. So the third and final step before actually restoring the tooth is the bond, sometimes also called the sealer or the adhesive. So the adhesive contains bis-GMA, which stands for bisphenol A glycidyl methacrylate, which is quite a mouthful. So it's good practice to gently air dry both the primer and the bond after application for just a few seconds in order to evaporate the solvent, which we no longer need, leaving behind the valuable monomers. HEMA, in this case, bis-GMA, in this case. And it leaves those monomers in a nicely thinned layer inside that cavity prep. And then we cure both the prime and the bond with a curing light. So what does the bond or adhesive do? Well, it chemically bonds to the underlying primer and eventually the overlying composite resin through methyl methacrylate bonds. Let's take a look at what that looks like under the microscope. So all of these components working in tandem create what's called the hybrid layer, which is the key to great bond strength. So remember, we have interprismatic enamel that has dissolved away from the etch leaving behind an irregular high energy surface. And we have patent dentinal tubules with collagen fibrils that hopefully have not collapsed on each other. So we're looking at this ideal surface for enamel, this ideal surface for dentin. And so imagine those, those surfaces that were into those openings were flowing primer and adhesive, which together form resin tags. So those are these extensions into those openings. In this case, we're looking at dentin. So th this is extension of that primer into those patent dentinal tubules. And this is where the magic happens. So the adhesive resins lock into both the microporosities of etched enamel and the intertubular dentin, and then we cure them in place so they are solidified and physically locked in there. So the key to adhesive dentistry is this micromechanical bond. Now there are chemical bonds, like we discussed in the previous slide, between the primer and the adhesive, and between the adhesive and the overlying composite, but the key between the tooth and everything else 
is this micromechanical retention offered by the resin tags. Pretty cool stuff. So let's unpack this really helpful chart from Spirit Education in order to better understand the four generations of bonding systems, most commonly used today and also most commonly tested on the board exam. This might seem super overwhelming, but we're going to go through it step by step, and I promise you, you'll understand all of this. So we're going to start with the left side of the chart first, with the total etch, otherwise known as etch and rinse systems. These are where you have the acid etch in a separate syringe, like the one I've been showing you throughout this video. These systems require that the dentin be left moist, like we talked about with the beach example. We want the dentin to be kept slightly wet after rinsing off the etch, otherwise if it's dried out completely, those collagen fibrils will collapse on each other. So this column all the way to the left is our fourth generation. And this is the this is considered the gold standard. The etch is its own syringe. The primer is in its own bottle, and the bond or adhesive is also in its own bottle. So it's a multi-bottle, three-step process. OptiBond FL is an example of that. The next column over is the fifth generation. The etch is still in its own syringe, but the prime and bond are combined into one bottle. So this becomes a two-step process, and so theoretically there's less room for error. Prime and Bond Universal and OptiBond Solo Plus are examples of this one. Now there's also a technique known as Selective Etch, and that's essentially these same two generations, except the etchant is applied selectively to enamel only, and this may reduce post-op sensitivity while maintaining the strong bond to enamel. All right, now let's move to the right side of the chart, which are the self-etch systems, where the etchant is now included in the bottle. It's no longer in its own separate syringe. The big thing with self-etches is that they leave behind the smear layer because the acid etch is less potent. So there are some considerations here. There's less post-op sensitivity because it's a weaker etch and the sawdust is left behind to block and clog those dentinal tubules. And if you, it's usually recommended to use a carbide burr if you're using a self-etch system because the diamond leaves too much smear layer behind. Also to consider, the enamel bond is not as strong with the self-etch system. As you can imagine, again, the etchant is just less potent. Also, these materials typically need to be refrigerated, and there's no rinsing allowed after the etch step. The etch is just left in place. So in other words, it does not require that wet bonding phenomenon that we've been talking about. So let's move to the sixth generation, which combines the etch and the primer in one bottle this time, and the bond is in its own second bottle. So it's still a two-step process like the fifth generation, but it's just a little bit different in how the components are combined. Clearfill SE is an example of the sixth generation. SE, of course, standing for self-etch. And then lastly, we have our seventh generation, which combines the etch, primer, and the adhesive all into one little package. So this is a true all-in-one system with only one step. The LPOP is an example of this seventh generation bonding system, and it's frequently used in orthodontics. All right, so now we can finally talk about composite resin, which was developed by Ray Bowen in the late 1950s, just a few years after acid etching by uh, Buonacore was discovered. So composite resin itself is a really interesting term. So composite means that it's made from two or more constituent materials that when mixed together make an entirely new material. And resin means it's a highly viscous prepolymer with reactive groups. 
that when cured by either blue light or chemical initiation, it undergoes cross-linking or polymerization from a liquid to a solid. So that name composite resin has a lot of information packed into it, and honestly, it perfectly describes what it is. So there are a couple of components that we need to talk about that are in every single composite resin. So first, the organic or resin matrix is usually bis-GMA, which is the same bisphenol A uh, glycidyl methacrylate that we saw in the adhesive or the bond before. Now this can also be other resins like TEG-DMA, UDMA, and others, all of which are different dimethacrylates. The hot button issue with composites was concern over cytotoxicity, and this is in relation to the resin matrix, because particularly this bisphenol A, which can mimic the effects of estrogen. You've probably heard of BPA, which is bisphenol A, because it's in disposable water bottles. And if you have a refillable water bottle, it might even mention that it's BPA-free on the bottom somewhere. Now, leaching of BPA can occur through wear of the composite or with resin that's left uncured. However, its potential to elicit adverse health effects is pretty negligible because so little BPA is released in this way. Next, we have the filler particles, which are these light green chunks swimming within this light blue matrix. So they are powdered glass or powdered ceramic glass. Silica is synonymous with silicon dioxide, which is found in quartz. So the filler particles specifically can be barium silicate, strontium silicate, zinc, or even silver silicate. And the filler particles range in size and shape, which affects various properties of the composite, which we'll go over in the next slide. The filler also is the most radiopaque element in the composite, which is a desirable feature, so it shows up well on radiographs. And lastly, you may have noticed the darker green coating on each of these filler particles, and this refers to the coupling agent, which is silane. So the filler particles within the resin composites are coated with silane in order to promote adhesion to the matrix and basically glue everything together. And if I'm being honest, guys, this entire slide should be in red text. It's so important, but I wanted everything to color coordinate with the image over here. But everything on this slide is incredibly high yield board exam info. So there are many different categories of composites based on what they're made out of. So we'll go th through each of these so you understand what they all mean. So macrofill or conventional composites are 80% filler. They have an eight micron particle size and these huge filler particles make the macrofill composites nice and strong. But the problem is it's really rough and the resin matrix wears at a faster rate, increasing its roughness over time. So for those reasons, the macrofill composites are no longer used, but they can be seen in older patients. The microfill composite is 40% filler and it a, has a very small filler particle size of 0.04 microns. So it's just the opposite to the macrofill. It's weak, but it has good polish and good wear resistance because there's more matrix holding everything in place. And it also flexes under pressure, so it can be good for bruxing patients. The hybrid composite combines the favorable, favorable properties of the macrofill, so it has a high amount of filler, with the smooth surface of the microfilm, because it has smaller particle size. So the hybrid's gonna have the best of both worlds. We're gonna have 80% filler, and a smaller particle size at about one micron for each filler particle. But we get even more advanced with nanofill, and nano hybrid, 
which is um, Filtech Supreme is an example of this, and they're the most popular composite restorative materials in use today. The nanofill has extremely small filler particles. We're talking 0 0.005 to 0 0.01 microns in particle diameter, so super small. And these really small particles can agglom agglomerate with each other to provide a full range of filler sizes. The nano hybrid incorporates these nanofill particles and integrates them with these other sizes here. So we're really just in, a, in an attempt to improve on the material with each of these steps. Now these last two are kind of in their own um, categorization. Flowable is talking about any kind of composites that have very low filler amount, so it's kind of like the microfill. And the good thing with the flowable is that it has a lower wear resistance. The packable is the other side of the coin. It has a high filler amount that makes it really viscous and almost feels like a macrofill. It's, it's supposed to handle like an amalgam based on how viscous that material is. So packable and flowable are just other ways you can categorize composite types. So the takeaways from this slide are that the larger fillers have more strength, but they do not polish or wear as well. They're rougher because of those large fillers. And then materials with higher filler content or higher filler percentage exhibit lower water absorption because there's less matrix or basically less room for water to seep in between those particles. So that's everything you need to know for those composite types based on the filler particle and filler particle size. All right, we also have two main categories of how a composite polymerizes. So we're talking about self-cure versus light cure. Self-cure, also called chemical cure, is a two-paste system. So one of the pastes is called the base, and it contains both composite and benzoyl peroxide, which is the initiator. And all this stuff is really good test information, and I can't, I can't stress that enough. So the benzoyl peroxide is the initiator. Interestingly, benzoyl peroxide is also a well-known acne treatment. So my memory tip here is that acne cream is the initiator for healthy skin, and it's also the initiator for self-care composites. So the other paste in this two-paste system is called the catalyst, and it contains both composite and tertiary amines. The tertiary amine is the activator. So you can think of A and A for activator. So these two components are, or equal parts of these two pastes are mixed together, and then the polymerization reaction begins. And once this happens, the operator has a limited amount of working time, usually just two minutes or so, before it becomes too stiff to manipulate. So you have to work pretty quickly. The light cure composite is the most common because number one, there's no mixing required and it's not a race against the clock. You have time to shape the composite and you decide when to polymerize it with the curing light. So this is a single paste system. We're no longer working with a base or in a catalyst. Camphor quinone is the photo initiator. This, is, this comes up all the time. My memory tip for this one is you like to take photos when you go camping outside. Camping and photos. So blue visible light of 468 nanometers approximately is what initiates this free radical polymerization through the action of camphor quinone. There's also what's called a dual cure composite that contains elements of both of these systems. So that's particularly useful for really big buildups where the light can only be used to cure most of the surface composite, but for areas that the light cannot reach, the chemical reaction will still carry out and polymerize itself. So composites can shrink about 2 to 3% as they polymerize, which is an incredibly important concept. Basically, free radicals break one of the carbon-carbon double bonds in the bis-GMA 
to form a single bond, and another free radical undergoes the same reaction with another monomer and adds it to this growing polymer chain. And as it keeps recruiting monomers, the volume of the resin decreases and that's how shrinkage happens. And eventually the side groups share electrons with each other via covalent bonds, which is called cross-linking, resulting in stronger, stiffer, cured material. So the configuration factor, or C factor, is the ratio of bound to unbound surfaces of the composite. So this is a little bit of a complicated topic, so let's really unpack what this means. We'll start with a class one composite. So we know for class one, only one surface is prepped. These are pit and fissure carries. So if you can imagine this as a cube, we have one side that is unbound, just freely exposed, and that leaves five sides that are bound or bonded to tooth structure. If we're talking about a class one posterior prep, those five surfaces will be the facial, lingual, mesial, distal, and pulpal walls. So we have a ratio of five bound surfaces to one unbound surface. So our C factor is simply five divided by one, which is five. In class two, we have four bound surfaces to two unbound surfaces. So our C factor is four divided by two, which is two, and so on. If we went through each one of these GV black classes, you'd realize there's an inverse relationship between the class and the C factor. So the higher our class is from one up to five, the lower our C factor is from five down to 0.2. So why, why does all this matter? Well, more surfaces you bond to, the more chance for that composite to peel away from those walls when it shrinks, which means more chance for micro leakage, more chance for post-operative sensitivity. So what do we do about it? Well, we can use smaller increments, use two millimeter increments of composite and cure each one before going on to the next increment. So there's one last thing we need to cover in this video, and that is the glass ionomers. So it's the other side of the spectrum of the tooth colored restorations. So salt matrix or glass ionomer came from the UK and resin matrix or composite resin came from the US and both originated interestingly enough in the second half of the 20th century. Now we, we've already talked at length about composite resin so you know all of this already and while resins contain a matrix and a filler glass ionomers consist of an acid and a base specifically polyacrylic acid and fluoroaluminosilicate glass, or FAS glass. And these are, particularly polyacrylic acid, are really important to know, and they come up on the board exam quite frequently. So advantages of glass ionomers. Self-adhesion to enamel and dentin, which means that you don't need etching or priming or bonding. You rely instead on chemical bonding between the carboxylic groups in the glass ionomer, and the hydroxyapatite. This chemical bond is known as calcium chelation. And you also get the benefits of fluoride storage and release within the material and less overall shrinkage. But the glass ionomers also come with limitations. It's a weaker material, has a longer setting time with a lack of control over when exactly it sets. So during the 1990s, a major development was hybridization of the technology of these two in an attempt to develop materials that exhibit the best characteristics of each. So the various hybrids fall on a spectrum between the salt matrix glass ionomers and the resin matrix composite resins. So first we have resin modified glass ionomers and they fall here on the spectrum closer to glass ionomers than to resin. Because it's a hybrid, it sets by both an acid-base reaction from the glass ionomer component 
and free radical addition polymerization, which is from the resin component. We have more rapid polymerization thanks to the free radical initiation of the resin component, and you gain some control over the setting time if it's light cure. You also get some fluoride release, and it's stronger than the conventional glass ionomer, so you get some unique benefits mixing these two in this way. Next, if we move a little bit more to the right on the spectrum, we get the compromers, or polyacid modified resin composites. These are anhydrous single pastes that contain major ingredients of both composite resins and glass ionomers, except for water, which is what anhydrous means. The exclusion of water ensures that the initial setting occurs only by polymerization and prevents premature setting, so you have a little bit more time to work with it as long as you keep the area dry. And again, that acid-base reaction of the glass ionomer component may occur later as the material absorbs water from the oral cavity, hence why you want to keep the area dry while you're working with it. It's attracted perhaps the most attention in orthodontics for cementing bands because the slower polymerization allows for more time to clean up excess around those bands and you gain potentially, although nominal, some fluoride release benefit. And lastly, we have the ionomer modified composite, which is essentially the exact opposite of the resin modified glass ionomer, just switching the words around. So it's closer to the other end of the spectrum. This one behaves mostly like composites, but contains some of those ion leachable classes in an attempt to gain some very minimal fluoride release. This one's perhaps the least common of the hybrids. All right, guys, so that's it for this video. I know there's a lot of content here, but thank you so much for watching this series. I really enjoyed making these videos for you guys, and I really hope that they're helpful for studying. Stay tuned for a practice questions video coming soon, testing all the stuff that you've learned in this series so far. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Rhea Wadwa, Jonathan Muff, Eric DiMatteo, Alexa Klunder, Jonathan Wynn, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hefnawi, and all my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.